so my name is Ken Griggs again, and I'm talking about Phoenix, the physics of uh, entanglement, networks, and information exchanges. Now, one of my favorite particles of all time um, in terms of uh, showing the, the absolute beauty of this new way of looking at it is the neutron. Now, how do we construct the neutron? Well, you know, we go back to our quark model and we ask the question, okay, well, we know that in a proton, uh, or that a proton is made out of two U quarks and a D quark. And so from that, we were able to construct how a proton probably and does in fact look in this theory. And what we found is that the two U's and the D and the two U's look like, look like this, okay? That is a proton. So now we ask the next question, okay, so can we do the same trick, can we do the same modeling technique to find out what a neutron should look like? And the answer, of course, is yes. And in this particular case, we know that a neutron actually has one U quark and two D quarks, whereas, again, the proton had two U quarks and one D quark. So in this particular case, we're looking for some structure that has two D quarks and one U quark. And so that structure should, and I'm going to, by the way, represent edges that need to be connected somewhere by dotted lines. Okay? So these three things must somehow be in the overall graph that represents the neutron. But let's notice something here. We notice that this, this dotted line here almost corresponds to what one might call a half of an edge. So if I hook this one up to this thing, this half edge here, right? So the half edge here is now attached to the edge here, or to the half edge here, it forms a whole edge, okay? There are no half edges in this theory. So this is just a modeling technique, a quark methodology, a quark leptonic methodology. So we know that if we count the number of half edges, they bet in order to form an actual particle, the number of half edges must be add to an integer. So in this particular case, we've got five half edges. That does not add to an integer. We're missing something. Okay, there's something missing that will not allow us to form a neutron just from these things alone. And so the technique, the, the way you craft particles or build particles in, in Phoenix is by first ask, doing what we did. You start off with what you think you know about the particle, two Ds and a U. And then if you see that it's falling short somewhere, and in this case it's falling short because the ed, there's a half edge missing, there's something missing, then you, you begin to add into it chunks of matter. And in our particular case, the most relevant neutral chunk of matter that you can add to it that's not queer is that little chunk of energy. So I'm going to draw that in here too. And that little chunk of energy, okay, if you recall, that little chunk of energy was this structure down here. Okay, that's a little chunk of energy. It's a vertex. And, and by the way, you can see, like I've just said, that Let's just take that little chunk of energy all on its own. It's closest to my face here, right? This thing right here. If you add together the number of edges, so each one of those being a half edge, if you add that together, you get three halves, which means that this is not, it cannot stand in and of itself. It is not a particle in and of itself. It must always be combined with other things in order to actually make a full-fledged particle. So this is how you build up the graphs. Graphs cannot exist this way. Okay? They don't exist like this. Quarks do not exist on their own. These do not exist on their own. They must form complete graphs like this. So in order to form the complete graph that forms a neutron, now we've added in this thing. Remember down here we had five half edges. Now we add to them three half edges. So five plus three is eight times a half means that we have the, the integer four. So we can now form four complete edges with this, with this uh, cadre of stuff. So I'm going to add in here the DDU, and I'm going to put either uh, um, a, um, 
uh, a gamma, okay, here to represent a chunk of energy, or you might put a star next to the U or a star somewhere on these to represent that a chunk of energy is there. Now the question is, can you form a single graph from these four things? Now, of course, I know you can, because I've been doing it for years. So let me show you what it looks like. But, but if you want, put a stop on this and just try on your own, just to see whether or not you can actually form a complete graph where, all, where everything's linked up with edges and that every vertex has three of something on it. That's how you form a complete graph. Now, if I were in your shoes, I'd be going, ah, oh, man, shit, he's asking me to do that. Okay. But it is a learning experience, and once you become, um, once you sort of see how it's done, then it just becomes old hat and old hand, and you're like, wow, this is just really easy. How come we haven't been doing this before? Okay, so this is what the neutron looks like. So here we have the four particles, right? So, or the four semi-quasi particles because they're not real. So we've got the U quark there, we've got a chunk of energy here, and we've got our two our two D quarks, right? D there and D there. So that's what we have. Now, that's a neutron. But why is this one of my favorite particles? Because when we actually go through, represent this neutron with a matrix, right? And I'm just going to do that really quickly. So we're going to we're going to um, write a label, one, two, we're going to label each one of these vertices so that we can form the matrix. So one, two, three, and a four. That's how I've labeled it. And now we're going to form a four by four matrix, right? So the size of the matrix is, in point of fact, the number of vertices. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. I'm labeling the columns and the rows. It's a big, it's a big matrix, OK? Okay, so that's what the matrix looks like empty. So we ask the question, on vertex 1, we have two loops, and it's connected to something else. So what's, what, how is vertex 1 connected to itself? So we add the two loops, and we get the number 2. It's really just the count, right? So that's 2 here. Now we go to vertex 2, and we ask the same question. How self-connected is it? How connected to itself is itself? And the answer is zero. So we're going to go here at our 2, 2 spot, right? 2, 2, 2. It's kind of hard to do this like this, but that's a zero. Pretty easy. Now we go to the 3, right up here, and we ask how connected is vertex 3 to itself? It's connected once to itself, one loop. So we put a 1 in the 3, 3 slot right here. And now we ask the same for the fourth one right here, and we get the same answer. It's once connected to itself in only one way, one loop. So that's filling in the diagonal. But now we have to ask, how is 1 connected to 2? And it's connected to 2 with one edge. So in the 1, 1, 2 location right here, we put in a 1. And because this matrix is symmetric, that means that if we flipped it, if we flipped it across the diagonal, it'd, be the, it'd look the same way. Because we're asking the same question, how is 2 connected to 1? It's connected to 1 in the same way. So how is 2 connected to 1? Like that. That is also a 1. Now we ask the question, how is vertex 1 connected to vertex 3? Right up here. There is no connection. So the answer is zero. And of course, we can do that by asking the same question in reverse. How is, how is 3 connected to 1? Zero, same way. So we put a zero down here, right? Zero down there. And we ask, how is 1 connected to 4 and 0? There's no edge connecting them, so there's a zero right here. And then we say the same thing in reverse. How is 4 connected to 1? There's a 0 right there, so we'll just stick those in. Now we ask the question, how is 2 connected to 3? There is an edge, and I'm, my finger is running across the edge right there. 2 is connected to 3 by a single edge. So we put a 1 in the slot of 2, 3 right there. And we also put a 1 in the slot of 3, 2, okay? 
because it's the same question in reverse. And we ask the question, how is 2 connected to 4? I'm getting a little bit better at being able to do this. But how is 2 connected to 4? Well, 2 is connected to 4 in the same way. It's got one connection. So we put a 1 in the 2, 4 slot right here, and then a 1 in the 4, 2 slot right here. And now we ask the final question, how is 3, con uh, sorry, how is 3 connected to 4? And there's an edge right there. See that edge? Okay. So the answer is 1. And so 4 to 3 is also 1. Bloop, bloop. Okay, so we've got it. This is our matrix, our matrix that in fact defines our, um, our particle that we're claiming to be the neutron. Okay, so this is where it becomes a little intense, but definitely cool. Okay, so what we would like to do is to demonstrate, is to ask, what does this, can this thing form something else? Can it decay into something else? And if it can decay into something else, what does it decay into? That's always the critical question. Okay, so we're calling this the neutron because it meets the quark characteristics, right? So when we ask about the decay, the question that we're really asking is, what's the characteristic equation? Because if we know what the characteristic equation is, is if we know what the eigenvalues are, then all we have to do is to compare the eigenvalues to the other eigenvalues of other particles. Okay, let me, let me just do a little explanation. If I'm dealing with, and we've done this in past lectures, if I'm dealing with an electron and, let's say, a W plus particle, okay? If I'm dealing with those two particles, then I know that since they're each a one-by-one one matrix, okay, all on their own they're a one-by-one, one, I can immediately put in the values, sorry, I can immediately, if, I'm, if my head is thinking correctly, I can immediately put in the values for those matrices. The electron has a matrix with a 3, and the W plus is a matrix with a plus 1. Now, what I want to do is to ask the question, um, what happens when I put this into um, a larger matrix? So if I now combine both of those particles, right? The way that you combine both of those particles is by simply, you know, creating a two by two matrix and asking how are they linked to each other, which is what we've been doing all along. So if I combine them into uh, a larger system of particles, then the matrix that I get is uh, three, zero, zero, and a one. Okay? And where we've represented that each of the bits of matter here, each of their one-by-one one representations is now along the diagonal of the larger structure of the larger uh, universe. So um, what I'm trying to really get out here is the idea that if I know what the characteristic equation is for these smaller particles, so for the electron the characteristic equation is lambda minus 3, and for the W plus, the characteristic equation is lambda minus 1. Okay? So if I know that that's what the equations are for the smaller structures, when I combine them in this larger way, I know that the characteristic equation is in fact, in fact just the product of those two smaller structures' characteristic equations. Like that. Okay? And if you go back to what we've done before, where we're asking the question about the neutrino, you'll find that, in fact, this is the characteristic equation of the neutrino, which is the characteristic equation of these two things. So the point of fact is that the, the characteristic equation um, can be multiplied together. When you have two particles that are independent of each other, that is to say that they form their own separate particles, but they're a part of the same system, then the characteristic equation of the system is the product of the characteristic equation of all the particles involved. Okay? So it's a beautiful property, it's matrix theory, you know, blah, 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 blah. But I want to use that here for asking, well, what does the neutron what does the neutron become? Why, why is why is this so important? Why, why are you doing this so important? Well, it's important because now what we're looking to do is to find the characteristic equation 
of this massive neutron 4x4 four four matrix. And the way we do that is under the same rule of taking the determinant of the matrix minus lambda times 1, okay, and, and setting that to 0. That's our equation again. Lambda is our monomial parameter. X, or chi rather, is the 4x4 the four four matrix. And the one here is a unit 4x4 four four matrix, okay, which is just the matrix with all ones on the diagonal and zeros everywhere else. Okay, so when we try to work this out, I'm going to write this out myself. And I'm already going to put in the lambdas and the whatnot as I write out the big matrix. And, you know, for posterity's sake, you probably want to work this out on your own, too, just to say to yourself, hey, I can do that. So, um, almost there. Okay. So the overall matrix with the lambdas in it now looks like this. I hope we all agree. I hope I got that right. I think I did. Okay. So now what we want to do is to take the determinant of this. Now, taking the determinant of something more than a 3 by 3 matrix, you know, there, there are many different methods for doing it. I can't even remember what my method is called, but I do use one of those methods, obviously, to do it. Um, so I'm going to work this out. And um, uh, I, I think it's called the method of minors. Um, but in the end, um, the way this trick works for me is I'm going to take the 2 minus lambda, and then find the determinant of minus lambda. Uh, that is to say, I'm going to take the first entry and then blot out the first row and the first column, and then find the, the, uh, um, the determinant of uh, what remains. I guess it's the remainder, whatever. Okay. So uh, let me just draw this out a little bit more for you. By the way, I had put a 0 here, and it's actually a 1, so I apologize. Um, okay, so I've, I've made that correction. And so, and then we have a minus 1 times 1, 0, 0, 1, minus lambda 1, and then 1, 1, minus lambda. Okay. So the way this minors thing work is, it works is you take this thing and then you, you multiply it by the matrix of what remains, which is this 3 by 3 matrix. What remains means that you, whatever, wherever you're taking an entry from, you now sort of blot out, zero out uh, that column and that row. So the only columns and rows left is this 3 by 3, and you find its determinant. And then you take the 1 and you take a minus because it's in that position but the 1, and then you multiply it times the, the, um, the determinant of what remains when you blot out the first row and the second column. So what remains is that, and then this, and then this, which is encapsulated in this matrix here, and then you find its determinant. Okay, so it's, 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 you know, it's laborious. Once you know how to do it, you can figure it out, but it's, it's you know, it's a laborious procedure. But it works. So I'm going to do it. And the blah, blah, blah. Determinant is always a little fugly. Blah, blah, and then it's a two, and then it's a minus three times one, no, 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 a minus two times uh, one minus lambda, and then a minus lambda. Okay, and then we have from the other one, a minus 1 times uh, 1 minus lambda squared, uh, 0, 0, plus 0, minus 0, minus 0, minus, minus 1. Okay. So now we have to put together all this crap. That is to multiply and make it make it look pretty, is really what I'm, I'm after. Okay. So let's make it look pretty. Oh, good lord. Um, and when you work that out after making it look pretty, um, three times lambda minus 
one. Okay, so when you make all of that look pretty, um, what you come out with, what you come out with is a characteristic equation that looks like this. Okay? That's after all the algebra, but you can do it. Okay? It's just algebra. I haven't introduced calculus to you yet, and you're solving problems. And the problems you're solving are how do particles turn into other particles? That's huge. Okay? You can't do this with QCD and QED and Feynman diagrams. You can't. I mean, not like this you can't. This is a non-perturbative, simple method for getting particle interaction. You know what particles went in, you know what particles can come out, and you know how they come out. Okay? So that's what this is all about. This is the characteristic equation. Now, the reason why I'm pointing this out is because the characteristic equation of the proton, which is a lot simpler to deduce, by the way, its characteristic equation is given by this. Okay, see that? That's its characteristic equation. And then the characteristic equation of the W particle, in particular the, um, the W minus particle, is given by Now, no, again, that's a lambda. I, I do lambda as a stranger. But, but the characteristic equation is given like that by that, okay? For the proton and for the W. So that's the proton and the W. Okay. Now, um, the, what I was trying to explain before about when you put systems of particles together is that all you have to do is multiply together their characteristic equations. So, the characteristic equation of a proton and a W plus particle, so that's a proton plus a W, sorry, W minus particle, is given by lambda times lambda, did I get this wrong? I think it's lambda minus one, not lambda plus one. Um, think new is that right so if we have a three and then it would be lambda minus three or three minus lambda um i think i have this right i think it's a lambda plus one but nevertheless lambda plus one lambda minus yeah lambda minus two and then lambda minus three okay i just wanted to make sure that all of those things uh, appropriately work out. But the characteristic equation of the proton and the W comes out to that. Now, by the way, that's the same characteristic equation that we've gotten out of the neutron. It's the same thing. And what that means is that the neutron can and does decay into this system of particles. This and this. That's why we went through this method is to demonstrate that just by looking at characteristic equations alone, i.e. eigenvalues, that you can determine what the decay sequence is of a particle. You don't actually have to, to work it out using the transformation matrix. But once you know that two particles or two systems actually can be transformed into each other, then you can easily and readily work out what the transformation uh, or the Hamiltonian is that connects in the transformation uh, matrix. And from that Hamiltonian, you can deduce so many other things. So in our particular case, what we're able to show, just by looking at the characteristic equation alone, what we're able to show is that this thing we're calling the neutron can, in point of fact, decay into something called the proton plus something called a W minus. Okay, I, my marker is uh, going a little... Uh, a little tired on me here, so I'm going to switch over markers. They weren't quite meant for this purpose, but uh, what do you do? Okay. So we've got a neutron that can be transformed into a proton plus a W minus. Now, how mysterious is that? Okay, you're sort of looking at me going, but, but, but what's so mysterious about it? Okay, so this is what we have. We've got a neutron this sucker over here that is decaying 
or can be transformed, which is a decay sequence, into an electron and a W. Okay? This is the first step in a neutron's decay process, people. This is how a neutron decays. It decays via the weak process. It is what we call a weak decay. Okay? And this is borne out very readily from Phoenix, from this methodology. Very readily. You get the neutron, which we surmise was the neutron, because it has two d quarks and one u quark and a little bit of energy. It's a little bit more spastic. It's a little bit heavier than its corresponding proton. Okay? So the neutron decays into the proton plus this other thing, and we're able to bear that out simply by looking at the characteristic equation, simply by looking at the eigenvalues. These processes, this process is the same eigenvalues as this process. This process is the same characteristic equation as this process. So there's a transformation that can get you from one to the other. That's the whole point. And so I, that's why this is so beautiful to me, because you see the first step in neutron decay. Now, you might also then ask the question, well, you know, we also know that the neutron, you know, in the last steps actually decays into a, um, an anti-electron neutrino and an electron. Well, remember before when we were able to demonstrate that our neutrino can, in point of fact, decay into an electron plus a W plus? Remember we were able to show that? Well, we can do the same process here, okay? And the way we conduct that process is that we add to the neutron a photon, okay? So if you add to the neutron a photon, which basically means you're adding to the decay sequence a, of the proton and the W, also a photon, okay? So I've added a photon on both ends. And the photon that we're adding is the photon that we've already explored. It's the photon that can become an electron and a positron, okay? So we now add in that photon. That photon breaks apart. In, in this process, that photon breaks apart. And when it does so, when it interacts to break apart, what we find is that we've got a proton plus a W minus plus an electron plus a positron. And by the way, everything that I'm showing you here can be borne out with the mathematics, with the matrix mathematics that I've been demonstrating before. But this is what happens when the neutron meets that, that electromagnetic photon. We get a process, we get a decay mode here. But we also have the ability to combine a couple of things in this decay mode. So two things that we'd like to combine are the W and the positron. Okay, I'm pointing that out this way. Those from our analysis before, okay, remember how we had before that the W plus and the electron gives us a neutrino? And now we have a W minus and a positron? Well, all we have to do here for this to work is to get its conjugate. Okay, you find the conjugate, the, the charge conjugate of it. You make it all into an antimatter equation. And when you do that, you have the anti-electron neutrino, which can decay now into a positron and a W minus. Now we can also show how this happens with the graphs. I just want to quickly uh, share with you that if the neutrino looks like that and becomes an electron and a W plus, Okay, so if that's what the neutrino graphs look like for this equation, then the anti-version, all, all of the loops are replaced with arrows, all of the arrows are replaced with loops. So it looks like this. That's what it looks like, okay? So this is the anti-electron neutrino, this is the anti-electron or the positron, and this is the W minus. Cool, huh? 
All right, okay. So what I'm trying to show here is that in our neutron decay procedure, we have this W minus and this positron. They can combine to form an anti-electron neutrino. Okay, and that anti-electron neutrino. So what we have here left over is a, pot, is a proton plus an anti-electron neutrino plus an electron coming from the neutron decay. So we have this now going on. Okay? Get it? So we see that we can go with the neutron in a direct decay mode going to a proton and a W. But the W in a second step immediately meets up with a photon. And in doing so, that photon W minus mode creates the electron and the anti-electron neutrino. That's what it creates. And so in the end, what we see in the laboratory is that the neutron decays into a proton, an electron, an anti-electron neutrino, and an electron. But it's not a first step process. It takes time to get to that point. It's several steps to get there. Cool. So what we've been able to demonstrate is that not only can we define the proton, not only can we define the electron, the W plus, the W minus, the positron, the neutrino, the antineutrino, uh, and even the muon, but we're also able to define the neutron based on this quark methodology. You know what the quark structure of a neutron is, and you use the methodology to construct the, the smallest version that Phoenix will allow for that particle, and then you test it and see whether or not there are any decay modes that match the decay modes of that actual particle. And the answer is absolutely for the neutron. Now what we find with the proton is that the proton has no decay modes. So let me just clarify what that means. When we have the proton, okay, we're running high on time here, so I don't want to make this long, but when we have the proton, we've just borne out that the proton has a characteristic equation that looks like this. Okay? It has a characteristic equation that looks like that. What we can demonstrate is when you look at all of the characteristic equations, when you ask the question, can this thing decay into something else? What you're really asking is, can this three-vertex system break down into either something that has a single vertex and then two vertices, or something that really has three disconnected vertices? Okay, you're really asking that kind of a question. Is it a system of a single vertex here and then two vertices that are linked in some way? Or can you form a, a graphs uh, that have three individual separate vertices. Now, in order to answer this question, all we have to really do is look at the characteristic equation. So to answer in terms of the last sequence, is there something that can be three different particles that this thing can break up into? The answer is no. Why? Because when we look at all of the single vertex things that we can have in Phoenix, there are only four of them. There's the electron, there's the W plus, there's the W minus, and there's the positron, okay? Those are the only particles that Phoenix will allow as actual physical particles in this theory. So can, and then we ask the question, well, what are the, what are the characteristic equations of each one of these? What are the eigenvalues? But the characteristic equation for each one of these is lambda minus 3 for the electron, lambda minus 1 for the W plus, lambda plus 1 for the W minus, and lambda plus 3. Um, is that right? Yeah, I think that's right. Lambda plus 3 for the positron. 3? Yeah, that, that, that's correct. Okay. Um, the reason why I'm concerned no, nope, we got it all right. Okay, we're square. So that's the characteristic equation for each one of those. Now we go back and look at the characteristic equation for this, and we ask, well, if this could break apart into three separate 
particles, those three separate particles must be one of these particles. Each one of them must be one of this set. And in that set, we've got these characteristic equations. So we go back up and look at the characteristic equation of the proton, and we see that only one part of it actually satisfies this condition, and that's the electron. The electron is the only particle that might somehow magically come out of this. But three particles cannot come out of this thing. Otherwise, you, this would either be like a lambda minus 3 cubed, or a lambda minus 3 times lambda minus 1 times lambda plus 1, or whatever. But it has all of these other two have to be down here, and they're not. So we know, identically, that the proton, in this theory, cannot decay into three particles. Now we ask, can the proton decay into two particles? One particle, we said yes, it would be an electron, right here. This thing right here, this thing right here, because it has the right characteristic equation. So we might identify the single particle as the electron. Right? But when we ask the question, well, what about these, these two that are somehow connected to each other? Are there any two vertex connected particles that have the characteristic equation of this? All right? The answer is absolutely not. There's not a single connect, and work it out on your own. Find, literally, find all of the, the V equals two connected particles. And I believe that the list is on the order of like 20 or 24 of them. And you will find that their characteristic equations are not this et quality. There is no characteristic, there is no V equals two particle that has that characteristic equation. So, identically, we can say that it cannot decay into an electron and something that does not exist. So the proton, in and of itself, is therefore a stable particle. It has no decay modes. Okay, it may look like it could partially decay, but that doesn't happen. There's no such thing as a partial decay in Phoenix. It either decays or it doesn't, period. Which basically means there's no transformation that can get you from this particle to any other system of particles. None. Not system of particles where it breaks apart into them. Okay, this may have a different configuration in and of itself, you know. Um, instead of this being vertex 1, maybe this is vertex 1, so it, it bends around and, and contorts itself. But short of that, this doesn't change. It is a stable particle. So we've demonstrated that the neutron that we've literally created as the minimal graphical structure uh, that uh, has the, the quark characteristics to it, that the neutron uh, has decay modes. And one of those decay modes has the right number of steps to take you from the proton uh, plus W minus to a proton plus an anti-electron neutrino plus an electron. And thus, that sequence of steps is what enables this to, to be a slow decay process, maybe taking 10 minutes, because it's got to go through a weak decay mode. And it only goes through, a, it primarily goes through a weak decay mode. And then we find that the proton does not decay. It is perfectly stable in this theory, just like the electron is perfectly stable in this theory. This is a beautiful thing. So that's what I wanted to point out as well in this theory. And I know it took us probably twice as long as any of the other features, but I did want to point that out because it's necessary. It's so cool. And this is these are the coolest particles, the very particles that make up the matter that we are and that we see and interact with. That's so cool. So we've just defined the electron, the proton, and the neutron and their decay modes and how they interact and blah 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 all with a theory that really shouldn't exist so i just wanted to point that out and let's go to the next one